Hello and welcome to the Brick Cave Media Podcast. My name is Patrick Hare, author of Corporate Boilerplate Vinegar from Brick Cave Books. The Brick Cave Podcast is brought to you by BC Book Club, Brick Cave Media's community portals for readers that love Brick Cave books and authors. You can join today and be part of the Brick Cave story at bcbookclub.com. And my name is Bill Campana, author of If Porch Lights Have Moths, Then Raincoats Have Fish, and the forthcoming Poems in the Key of A Negative. From Brick Cave Books, we are here tonight in the Brick Cave studio, located in the Brick Cave office right here in beautiful downtown Mesa, Arizona. Topics? Okay, <laughs> topics. Hey, question, Patrick. <laughs> What has been the most intimidating place you've ever read a poem live? You mean outside, like, the Willow House? Yeah. Um, <laughs> gosh. The Willow House was not necessarily intimidating. It was just smoke-filled. Yes, inside the Willow House, you got just marinated in tobacco smoke because everybody could smoke then, and it was like your di- average dive bar but without any cheap liquor to drown it out with. And then they had the... Uh, the cheap out- coffee there. Yeah. Then they had the outside part, their little annex, which was kind of a garage, where they um, they had AA meetings after the poetry reading part. And so a lot of the people, you know, they would show up a little bit early, and sometimes they would mistake the poetry reading for the AA meeting. So it made for some interesting times. My name is Bill C., <laughs> and, I, and I'm a poet. What was the most intimidating place you were ever in, Bill? Uh, Patrick's wedding. <laughs> really? That was fantastic. I was nervous. My hands were shaking bad. Really? I don't know if you saw them, but, but it, it was almost like I was holding a waving flag in my hand. Oh. Hey, you know Uncle Milty put a shirt on just for that wedding. Good for Milty. You don't. You never saw that guy walking around the neighborhood. No. No shirt. He's got shirt. He had... Uh, Shoes, the, the typical, you know, middle-aged white guy shoes, except he had John 316 written on the tops of them in case he forgot that Jesus loved him. And he, he would have, like, uh, a flashlight, mace, and a gun. Wow. So he was and, wow. dressed to the nines. Yes, because he was afraid of terrorists and lowlifes down by the tire store. Wow. And so the other neighbor I had. Maybe it was the intoxicating smell of rubber. It just yes. drove him over the edge. Like, <laughs> so, mm, discount tired. Oh, yeah. Mm, good year. Yes. My other neighbor had said the most likely thing that's going to happen is someone's going to push Uncle Milty over and take his gun. <laughs> you ever uh, bumped into him over the years? Uh, not since I lived down there. Um, it, it was sort of a surprise for him when I was moving out because I just pulled up a U-Haul truck and threw everything in it. Well, I was also surprised that I was getting married, so I invited him the day before. It's like, oh, you know, Heather and I are going to make our marriage official because it's not. And living in sin across the street from you, and you've been making broad assumptions about who's married and who's not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. So, yes, he, uh, speaking of Bibles, getting back around to that, he gave us uh, the Bible with the, um, the text in red where Jesus talks, and then also it had like a tape version of it, which I didn't know. It was only one tape, so I don't think they got the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. Who is the voice of Jesus on this, by the way? Is it okay. Orson Welles? That would be a pretty good voice of Jesus. <laughs> Somebody with a beard, I hope, at least. At least I hope he looked like a, a, a hippie. So anyway, I'm going to read a poem now. If you, if you got nothing else to talk about, what, what's the name of the show, Patrick? Are we going to we're going to yeah. give this like Beans and Franks? Uh, Should we throw it out to the fans and ask them to suggest a show name for us? Um. <laughs> Sparks and Birdies. I don't know. We'll, we'll come up with a name. So anyway, you ever have one of those dreams where you're naked, you're out in public, and you're you left the house and you're not wearing clothes? Those are dreams. You, yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you ever had those dreams? That, that feeling of no, of just, hopeless insecurity, yeah, it like in real life, so it's, it's like, my God, why? Why didn't I? Why? I've had those dreams. Okay. It's a fairly common dream. Other people have those dreams too. Anyway, this poem is called "Everybody Secretly Prefers Everybody Else Be Something Other Than Anything But Themselves." Last night, I had one of those humiliating dreams where I was out in public and apparently had left the house without putting on my mask. I experienced shame 
as I tried to remain inconspicuous in a crowd of people while struggling to understand why I was not dreaming about not wearing pants. Incidentally, I was not wearing pants. Thank you. <laughs> That's pretty fabulous. All right, then. Okay. I wanted to read one of my newer pieces, which I only read once at the Nerd Slam last year at the uh, Phoenix Comic Con Fan Fusion Stills Dash yeah. and Young, whatever Ex they call it. Exposition. Turner Overdrive, yeah. something like that. <laughs> So anyway, the, uh, the gist of this poem is that if you haven't seen 20 movies in a series, you're just not going to get it at all. So, uh, so for someone like Bill, I didn't see this, yeah, he didn't see all 20 of the movies. Scotty had a four-inch crystal in his engine that could help him travel across the galaxy at warp speed. Superman had a 10-inch, 128-terabyte knowledge crystal that could build cool houses and summon Marlon Brando. Nicholas Flamel had a five-inch philosopher's stone that could create a bulge in your pocket when you're confronted by your deadliest enemy. And then there's Doctor Strange, who used his one-inch emerald microstone to screw up the whole universe forever because he got lazy sometime after a few trips into the future. Carol was only gone for a second. She and Bob had had their first baby, and she was resting in the hospital bed. Ted and Alice came to see them. All of a sudden, the bed vanished, and Carol fell to the floor of a decrepit, half-empty hospital. Ted had to pick her up, and they waited through a world of confused chaos until they got back to her home, where they found out that in the blink of an eye, Bob and Alice had set up a household and then had two kids of their own. Carol's newborn daughter is now five, but calls Alice mommy. The real kicker is, Alice and Bob are angry at Carol and Ted for abandoning them and being clueless about the fact that the same green monster who trashed New York City went on and put out went and put on a pair of oversized nerd eyeglasses and then made a speech to the world about how this whole thing couldn't be fixed, so everyone had to move on. Paul Everyman was only gone for a second. He got up to wash his face and came out of the bathroom to see an older-looking version of his girlfriend Cecilia going reverse cowgirl on a balder-looking guy he used to hang out with. He started yelling and stomping on the floor. She started crying and screaming, Honey, you don't understand. Please try to listen. The talking raccoon said you were never coming back. You were only gone for a second. You reappeared in your suburban house, which is dark, dank, and infested with rats, like some episode of Life After People. Later, you'll learn that half of everyone moved into parts of the city where they could keep up the infrastructure. You'll also find out that your copper pipes and wires have been ripped out, so Stark Industries could build an automated orbiting death ray to stop the incessant attacks from video game playing gold skinned people who are carrying on some sort of grudge about stolen batteries. Lex Luthor could have told Doctor Strange about a material that could counteract meddling superhero journalists. Doctor Jones could have told him about a poorly plotted Crystal MacGuffin that could ruin your whole franchise. But only Mr. Chekhov could have told Doctor Strange about the monkey's paw, which is thrice as dramatically ironic when you only have the power to use it for one wish. There were 14,605,000 possible futures. Doctor Strange picked the worst and dumbest. He should have known that being gone for five years ain't going to work out for anyone if it didn't work out for Tom Hanks. Half the population was gone for a second, and the other half spent two years eating up the food supply and another three years rebuilding a sustainable diet for themselves. Now their whole plan is shot to hell. Somehow a handful of people in costumes are running in the world, and Pepper Potts runs Stark Industries now, but all they sell is funny green eggs. But that's not even the worst part, because somewhere in a Disney galaxy far, far away, the Rebels were celebrating the five-year anniversary of their incredibly unlikely victory, where at the moment of the greatest peril, Kylo Ren's first order and a reincarnated Palpatine inexplicably vanished in a cloud of dust. Everyone is celebrating Galactic Universal Disarmament on Life Day, but then, thanks to the incompetent Doctor Strange, the Sith hits the fan. Wow. Wow. Yes. That's... So if you hadn't seen the Avengers series. So Bob, Carol, and Ted and Alice, man, that goes way right. back. <laughs> was, was, let me, was, was Art Garfunkel in that, or am I? He was in that. Nobody else caught it. <laughs> he was, uh, yeah, it was Jack Nicholson. Man. 
<laughs> who were the ladies in there? Uh, yeah, I've, I've drawn a blank. In the poem, or no, in in, in the the Bob Bob Carroll. Oh, Bob Carroll, Ted, and Alice. Yeah, that was way back. This is this is not a a a, a, a Google type computer, Bob. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't lend itself to that. It, no, it doesn't. It's it's just a word processor. It's Bill's light up typewriter. Yeah, it it is. It is. It's, yes. it's like you know. Here, he want a want a Mike Pence joke, Patrick. Sure. Here. Mike Pence hollers preach when he watches mimes perform. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, you are correct, sir. So, uh, how about this weather? <laughs> you like heat, Patrick? You like you like you like it when it's over one ten for like thirty days straight? Oh my God! Yes, it's always nice to get the record for heat when you're staying at home all day, paying for your own air conditioning. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, we got to come up with a name for the show. How about rape whistle and cowbell? <laughs> no things that are going to be left in the editing room floor. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh my goodness. Uh, shot glass and sponge bath. Well, there we go. <laughs> uh, okay, roustabout and the door-to-door Electrolux vacuum cleaner salesman. Which one of you is which? Doesn't matter. <laughs> I don't know. I could sell a mean vacuum cleaner. Uh, burnished chestnut and finder's fee. Tight ass and tattletale. There you go. That sounds like a game show from uh, the 80s. Dick McClish and the Tennessee sponge bather. <laughs> Chuckle fuck Friday and the gingerbread fetus. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Um, where are these coming from? I've, these are from my, my list of uh, lesser known 70s buddy films. <laughs> Oh, I was going to say, that's very improvisational. Yeah, snap line. peas and carbuncle. Gargoyle and the bishop. Foxtrot and bouncing check. <laughs> Wombat and scuppernond. You know what a scuppernond is? I do not. It's a uh, fruit. It's like a giant grape. Uh, wristwatch and coffee pot. Trump and Pence. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Mule deer and the staunch Republican. Donnie and Mike. Smack Spoon and Hooch. All right. Sweat Locks and Stunt Meat. All right. It's time It's time for Bill to read a poem. Bill, are you ready to read a poem? Sure. Sure, I'm ready. Can I do two? Because my poems are short. Yes. You know, you know how short my poems are. I saw a picture of, of some old guy, and he had a giant bow tie on. And the guy looked like he was from, like, I don't know, early 70s. Black and white picture, kind of like like it may, may have been in a local newspaper, and it just made me think. It's this is called the active bow tie. The active bow tie lands on the old man's throat. He sings an angelic tenor trill, each note clear and pure, until the butterfly strangles a flower for a throat singer. Uh, this next poem, uh, I, I all my life I have spent trying to uh, uh, escape Catholicism, and it, it keeps finding me in, in weird places. I found this, you know what a prayer card is? Yes, I do. <laughs> I found this prayer card next to my car at work, and uh, I looked at it when I got out of my car in the morning, and I just thought, no. Oh, yeah. <laughs> then when I was going home, it was still there, and, and uh, I said, okay, you're coming with me. <laughs> so... <laughs> The next 48 hours were the most energetic 48 hours of that prayer card. So, so as I examine <laughs> examine this thing, it was uh, uh, well. I'll just read the poem, and you will all get a feel of w- what's going on here. It's called "Render Us Cautious, O Virgin." Oh, Saint Lucy, I found your prayer card in a dirty parking parking lot, tattered, wind blown all over Northwest Phoenix a sinful stroll away from the adult entertainment store and the strip club. You survived many vehicles driving over your laminated image before you found your home next to where I plant my left foot. I'm sure you were repeatedly ignored, as was your abundant grace. 
please explain why I feel compelled to wash my hands after holding you and reading your prayer, fading and torn. Oh, oh St. Lucy. There's the name. Oh, St. Lucy. Oh, that, that should be the cover of, of my next book. Oh, Saint Lucy! Saint, oh, Lucy! <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear Lord! Oh boy! Right, Patrick, what do you got? Patrick's going to read it now. Patrick, read us a poem called Saint Ethel. Saint Ethel. Saint Fred. <laughs> the Mertzes of the Mertz Saints. The Mertzes, Fred and Ethel. The Mertzes. Yes, it always intrigued me that uh, when Lucille Ball got a new show, Vivian Vance came back, but she wanted to be called Viv because everyone was calling her Ethel. Yeah. And then uh, Fred Mertz, Vivian Vance just hated him, so yeah. he wasn't part of the show. No, he went on to be Bub. In the, yes, in my, my three sons. sons. And then he dropped dead. Then it was Uncle Charlie. He dropped dead. He, they said the, the, the three sons would go to lunch with him while he had uh, martini after martini. Really? Yeah. Wow. I bet that was a Sounds riot. Sounds like oh, a good God. time. He probably it's starts just swearing just like par a for the course in Hollywood, days. isn't it? Swearing like a sailor after a couple of couple of olive salads. What <laughs> 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 which one of you is Chip? <laughs> Go get me another drink. Get get the bartender over here. William Frawley, that's his name. <laughs> you got a you got a casting call at one that's not a lot of time to drink. Did I ever tell you about the time I nailed Ethel? <laughs> she kept wanting me to call her Viv. No way! <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah, no, wow. I, was, I, I said there hard, was sass today. It's hard to compete sass with some of this today. stuff, man. I feel like I should snort a couple lines of Coke, <laughs> which would be a first. But, you know, then I could at least amp up my game a little bit here. Give him the hella hat. Right. Wow. Okay. This piece is called Always Darkest. The heat death of the universe starts with me. I am moving the hands forward on the entropy clock. No one's got the time to wait for all the epics and eons until the blackness dominates the cosmic horizon. It's up to me to leave all the lights on and kick up the furnace until all the kinetic loses its potential. I will burn the galactic supercluster at both ends until a relativistic jet flames out. I'm, keep, I'm building it up for a big rip of fizzling black holes in my absolute zero kelvinated deep freeze. Right now, only 27% of our universe is invested in dark matter. That's a failing grade. Who wants to wait 10 trillion years for little red dwarf stars to burn themselves out when our own sun gets a few billion? We gotta suck up all that space junk and nebula vape it into a supermassive black hole. I'm here to hammer on the Higgs field until the god particle's last gap. Building a quantum tunnel to the quiet realm of iron stars who emit a faint infrared lament for their powerhouse supernova glories. I must saturate every dimension of space with cosmic rays in a blinding event collapse the false vacuum in reversed gravity until the cinders drift cold and alone in a vast and null expansion. Lights out. So what else? So How about there, that William Frawley? Are there other dimensions, Bill? Uh, I'll, tell you that, I'll tell you the time I nailed Vivian Vance. I was all over her like Desi on a bongo. <laughs> I'm just worn out from the heat, man. I don't even work in it. It's just torched me. It is really something. I mean, I have to keep some of the shades closed in my house because if you open them, this, the heat just radiates off of it. And so, yeah. yeah. I burn my hands on my cat. That's how hot he is. <laughs> I can't pick him up anymore. It's like, God, <laughs> you're, you're hot. Hot. Yeah, plus the water was out in the park when I got home, so it's like, oh, jeez. But it's back. Do you need back to, does it say you need to take a shower of the sink? No, it, yeah, <laughs> bird bath. I'll take a bird bath. I'll, I'll find a, a, I'll find a wishing well somewhere in Mesa. Come out with some coins while I'm in there. Yeah. 
So, uh, uh, so talk about your new book, Bill. The uh, if porch lights have moths, that no, one. No, talk about the one that you're working on. The one I'm working on, I I haven't a working title yet for it. Well, wait a minute, maybe I do. Right now, it, it it's it's known as uh, manuscript number seven. Or roadmap for a thrill ride. Or when less is not when less is more, nothing is everything. Or reverse taxidermy. Or tinnitus is tape is for those who think in analog. And uh, right now I've got like uh, about 58 poems deep. In uh, August, or not August, July, I, I did a, uh, a 31 for 31. I did 31 really? poems, yeah. And, and, of course, you're saying, are they all great? They're uh, all built. 28 are. Right. <laughs> I'm going to say built. 28 are pretty damn good. Uh yeah, it's uh, probably we'll we'll go with uh, roadmap for a thrill ride, because it just sounds ah oh, sounds dangerous. <laughs> it sounds just we're all living in a dangerous time. Uh, dangerous. Where every word I speak was written by Bernie Taupin. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you, you rarely hear his name. It's always uh, Elton John. Yeah, he's, uh, it's, a, it's not a bad deal. I mean, you get the. Somebody else is, you know, going out on the road and doing your stuff. Yeah. yeah, and you just sit back and count the money. Yeah, so introduced Alice Cooper to cocaine. Didn't end well. <laughs> 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 he wrote, we built this city on rock and roll. That didn't end well. <laughs> he wrote that? Yeah, he wrote that. Wow. Yeah, I know. It's a kitschy song, but... Uh, I guess he still made money on that too. So it's like people say it was the worst song of the '80s, but you know there were some really bad songs. Yeah, I was gonna say, there's a lot of competition there. <laughs> yeah, the '80s was. And there you go. Well, I had these coworkers. I had these they, coworkers. They would talk shit about everyone. They would just uh, they, you know, they never actually did what they were supposed to do. But it was like these little group of guys in their mid twenties. Former employer. Let's make that clear. Yes, exactly. A former employer. But anyway, they would also start talking about the bombs they made, and they would do wow. these bomb-making videos on YouTube. It's like, okay, this is all in the work network right now. You're looking at bomb-making videos. Somebody probably monitors this kind of activity. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, who's looking up the videos? Now we can ch check to make sure if these guys are legit or if they're just the average idiot that's, you know, blowing stuff up from his backyard. We'll put him on the list for later, you know. <laughs> So when you can't fly on the airlines anymore, you'll know why. <laughs> Alrighty then. Yeah, that was just sort of a, like, why? So unfortunately, Bill, no one sent you a poem to read this week. No. no. Uh, Sorry. Hey, uh, oh, you know what? That's okay. Because uh, I could I could read another one if you you know pull my you know. Can I pull your beard? If you pull my beard, I'll read another one. Because I'll just pull your beard just for the fun of it. You can read another one whether regardless. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, da, da, da. Are you going to let someone else pull your beard? Can we <laughs> do this and make a contest, an audio contest? Uh, the last person yeah. to pull my beard was uh, Samaya Ewing. I remember that. She's a long time like, ago. She used to like to tug on my beard. And uh, it was all right. There, buddy. She even braided my hair for me one night. I don't know why. I remember when you had hair that. She she that braided it. I thought, oh my God, look, I'm Willie Nelson now. <laughs> Man alive, I'm Willie Stinking Nelson. I've I've been uh, for a long time. Uh, ventriloquism has always been a, a, a what do you call it? A, an interest. Fascination. In, a fascination. There you go. We uh, talked about it. You guys actually talked about it on the show before. Did I? Yeah. You guys talked a lot about it. <clears throat> Not necessarily that it was fascination, but I don't think I've read about ventriloquism. Did, I, I, I didn't read this one, but no. this one's fairly new. It's called Mr. Darkness, Mr. Light. The ventriloquist forgot to bring his puppet to the theater. Did I read this one last, last month? I don't remember. Bill. He uh, takes center stage with a desk lamp and pulls the chain when it is its turn to speak. The ventriloquist says to the lamp, Great artists never not appear as themselves. It doesn't matter 
what is documented or performed, as long as it is true to the artist, that is the humanity. Light, dark, light, dark, light, dark, light, dark. Oh, the humanity. Oh, my God. It's first in the flame. Son of a <laughs> light, dark, light, dark, light, dark. All right, you got it a couple minutes. You got a couple minutes, Dave. All right. Okay, I got one. Go, on. go, Patrick. Go for it. All right. Go, Patrick. Go. Step up, Patrick. This one is called Untitled. <laughs> Yay! Yeah. to us to make sure that we understood that. Well, that's the title, yeah, Untitled. Right. Yes. This poem is Untitled. I give birth to children that aren't worth naming. I just want a quick golf clap when I read my poems. It's not look like I took any time to revise the poem or practice reading it because you, my audience, are not worth my time. It takes a good six seconds to come up with a descriptive title, and that six seconds I could spend scratching myself. Hey, look at me! Hey, look at me! I'm deft. I've got less substance than styrofoam. Pay attention. I've got a magic microscope projector. I can take one sad event and convince you it's a crisis. Paint a picture with tears and tell you it's a conspiracy that you took part in. I can take a crisis and say that it's none of our business. I can tell you the difference between religion and politics. Religion is what you have. And you have failed me as an audience. I have come to enlighten you, to lift your poor benighted minds out of their darkness, and you don't care. Can't you see how clever I am and how that makes me a better person? I'm like that helpful guy who carried the cross up the hill for someone else to die on. Wasn't that a great favor? I don't need titles because I don't even need my own ideas. I've got a professional axe grinder to email me his anonymous thoughts, and all I have to do is repeat them, repeat them, repeat them, because I want to believe. My copy and paste philosophy needs no critical judgments, and I'm forwarding it to everyone. It doesn't have to be true if it serves the greater good, so don't break the chain. My thinking style is like cookie dough in a bucket, pre-cooked bacon, and putting in a plastic cup. It was made for me by someone else, irradiated into blandness, and completely disposable. This poem is untitled. Hooray. That's my revenge for everyone who came up and read untitled poems. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So thank you again for listening to this edition of the Brick Cave Podcast. Anytime you'd like to hear us, join us online at BrickCavePodcast.com. Our BC Book Club members can enjoy extra episodes and other great advantages such as free books. Details on our BookClub.com, our BCBookClub.com. And again, thanks everyone for listening. Join us next month for another edition of Fox Trot and Bouncing Check, Sketch Pad and Earlobe, <laughs> Flash Card and Squeegee. Loose Lips and Meat Stain, Clank and the Mongoloid, Tow Truck and Gas Chamber, Headlock and Ringworm, Smack Spoon and Hooch, keep going, keep going. Dick McClish and the Tennessee Sponge Bather, Turn Your Head and Cough, Stutter Step and Kidney Stone, Fruit Cake and Whammy Bar, Chicken Wing and Speedo, Speedo and Chicken Wing, Hitchhike and Pulled Pork, Hoofmeat and Snowstorm, Klondike and Doppelganger, Perry Mason and Robert Ironside, <laughs> Fibonacci and the Sonneteer, Webbed Feet and Carpet Tacks, Cream Puff and Torsion Bar, Beaver Pelt and Jackhammer, 